Hello, my name is Joel Van Sickle. I'm an application engineer at Howard MathWorks. I'm going to be walking you through this video of hardware in the loop testing for power electronic systems modeled in Simulink. Uh, we're going to combine the power of Simulink and real time hardware, in this case, Speedgoat hardware, to show you a demo. That demo is going to be how to take your Simulink models to deploy for hardware in the loop testing. We're going to focus on how to deploy them to an FPGA, which will enable us to run orders of magnitude faster. Specifically, we're going to target the speed of 1 megahertz for 1 microsecond time steps. This is very useful if you want to capture switching events in your simulation. Now for an overview of what we will be looking at today. We're going to start with a quick overview of what hardware in the loop testing is, in addition to a quick demo of the system we're working on today. We're then going to review a system level model of the inverter and motor. This model is then what we will take through the HDL coder workflow to convert the floating point operations to HDL code. This will enable us to run our simulation at a megahertz rate. This will give us one microsecond time steps, which is good enough for most applications in capturing switching events. Finally, we will take this HDL code, we will deploy it to the target hardware and run that system real time and look at some of the relevant waveforms. So as I mentioned, we're going to start by doing an overview of what hardware in the loop is. So for most cases, when you're following a model based design workflow, you'll have a controller and a plant. And the plant is the system you're trying to control. So for this demonstration, our controller, it's going to be a controller. And it's going to be using field oriented control because it's controlling a permanent magnet synchronous machine. And then our model, or the plant of the system, is going to be a motor and an inverter model. And this is also going to include some models of the peripheral system, such as encoders and ADCs. Now, the reason you do this initially is you can do some of this work just on a desktop simulation. You can test out your algorithms. You can test out some big picture ideas. But eventually, you need to take your design to hardware. So you want to take your control algorithm and you want to deploy it to actual hardware. In this case, I'm showing you a picture of a TIC2000, a very common platform for this type of work. Now, normally to test this out, I would need the final product that it's going to be controlling. However, I can take advantage of real-time systems, such as a Speedgoat, to emulate the final system. And so I can connect these together and utilizing high-speed DAX ADCs, I.O. lines, in addition to many different communication protocols, this Speedgoat machine can act as if it's the real system. And that allows you to test many cases with your controller, even though you do not have access to the final system. Now, for the particular demonstration we're going to be showing, I've got uh, two Speedgoats set up, actually, because in my my lab, it's a bit easier to do it this way. So the Speedgoat on the left is going to have the control algorithm loaded onto it. And the Speedgoat on the right is going to have the model on it. So the Speedgoat on the right has the higher end FPGA. That's what we're going to be doing hardware in the loop testing with. And so I'll just show you a quick demonstration of this working. Just play this video. And you can see that we turn the system on. It's going to start by going up to 50 ratings a second. I'm going to add a torque load and then also increase it to 100 ratings a second. And then it slows down and comes to a stop. And so that is the system that we're going to be building and deploying to today. So you'll see a very uh, similar demonstration at the end as we deploy everything to the FPGA. There are two primary different approaches in how you're going to accomplish your hardware in the loop simulations. And that has to do with the fact that there are effectively two different ways to simulate power electronics real time. The first way in simulating these is a simplification. It's taking an average model of the system. These are very fast simulations. They uh, skip over your switching event details, so you're not going to capture those harmonics. But they are very good at capturing your system level dynamics, and they're very useful if you're using classical control techniques. But again, they are a simplification, and there are many cases where an average simulation isn't good enough for the needs of your application. 
In that case, you step up to a switching simulation, which does capture these switching events. It is going to give you that harmonic content. But more than capturing just the harmonic content, it will capture non-linearities non caused by your switching. It will capture the effect of your switching strategy. It lets you do a device by device fault level analysis. Uh, so there are a number of reasons why you might want this level of detail. Now, I just talked about this in terms of average and switching, but we also need to talk about this in terms of the hardware implementation because there's two different ways to implement these in hardware which are relevant. So it's pretty much going to be the same slide over again, just now focusing on hardware. So for average mode, this is simple and fast. This means we can implement it on a CPU. A CPU is doing everything in serial, which limits how fast it can run something real time. The advantage of a CPU is their cheaper hardware. Using the SpeedGoat solution, you can leave your systems in the continuous domain. And you can pretty much use any CoGen compatible block you want with a SpeedGoat on the CPU. So there's a lot of advantages. It's cheaper to implement. You'll get up and running faster. But again, sometimes an average simulation isn't good enough. Now for the switch simulation, because you typically need to run faster to capture these switching events, means you need to go to an FPGA. Now the FPGA can do many things in parallel, which is why it can run so much faster. Uh, some of the disadvantages are that an FPGA is going to cost more. You're going to need to convert your model to discrete time for this, and you're going to typically be limited to single precision floating point values. But that's actually a huge improvement from where things used to be because you didn't used to be able to use any floating point values when doing an FPGA design. So it's significantly easier now to take your models to the FPGA. So now that we've talked a little bit about hardware in the loop, let's focus on the model we're going to be working with. So in Simulink, we have a pretty common demo we show for rapid control prototyping, for uh, deploying to targets, whether they be CPUs or FPGAs, for the control algorithm, as well as for hardware in the loop testing. So here you can see our Simulink model. I'm going to go ahead and open it up in Simulink so that we can look at it in more detail. Uh, so now I have Simulink open, and we're going to run this model. Now I'm going to sh the first simulation I'm going to show you is going to be uh, average mode just so we can run it faster and so what's happening right now is at the top you can see the velocity and so we're going to command 50 ratings a second you'll see that happen at time two you're going to see a torque load get hit in and that happened there we're going to command it to 100 ratings a second uh, we're going to let the the voltage uh, the velocity droop and then we're going to take away the torque input right there and so this is the system that you saw me simulate before in that video it's the same thing so again some some relevant features on this right here is when we command 15 ratings a second uh, this whole time is when we've applied a torque load uh, and here's where we commanded 100 ratings a second uh, and you can look down here and you can see the corresponding currents uh, to those systems so obviously there's more current when we're accelerating um, so that's just a quick overview of what we're running, what you're seeing when we're doing the hardware in the loop test. So let's let's stop and look a little bit into this motor model, see what's going on. So I'm actually going to switch over to the, the switching mode one that we run on the FPGA. Again, I didn't run this one because it uh, takes very long to run. On a desktop, it runs real time on the FPGA, but it would have taken probably a good five minutes, if not longer, to run on here. And so here we have the system that we want to simulate, and everything in here is what goes on the FPGA. And so you can see everything else. I've just sort of uh, done some bookkeeping to wire the signals. I like to use go, ta go to tags to clean things up. But everything inside here will be going directly to the FPGA. So if we open this up, we can see what our system includes. So I have an inverter model over here. This is the model of the PMSM that we're using. We've also modeled the ADCs, both for current and voltage sensing. 
and we've modeled the encoder. Now, typically, we would like to show a resolver uh, for a lot of applications, but the live demo we take where we bring the inverter and the motor with us is a 30 watt machine. Those are typically using encoders, don't have access to a resolver. So that's why this demo uses an encoder so we can validate the data against the hardware that we have. And so all of this is in Simulink. So like one thing you'll notice here is that we've uh, slightly tweaked a specialized technology block to output Simulink signals. So that's how we're connecting everything. This was done with a script. Uh, if you're using the powertrain block set models, those can be used pretty much as is. Um, we're not really going to get into how to uh, take the different physical modeling tools down this path. This is more once you have a model that is discrete and is in Simulink, how do you deploy it to the Spigo and run it at rate? If you want to talk about uh, how to get there, depending on how you've modeled your systems, please contact your sales rep and we can uh, guide you through the specific process because it's different depending on how you've set up your models. So this is the system we want to generate HDL code from. And we're going to do that using the HDL Coder Workflow Advisor. This marks the point in the webinar where I'm going to start getting into a bit more detail on how to actually use the tools to do everything. And so here is a step-by-step -step process of typically what needs to happen in order to take a design all the way to running real-time on an FPGA. So the first one is just defining your high-level I.O. You need to convert the system to discrete time. You need to convert it to single precision. There's some settings for the model, specifically for HDL code generation. You need to make sure all your blocks are HDL compatible. And then you actually need to run it through the synthesis process. Once that's done, you can deploy it to your Speedgoat machine. And uh, the HDL workflow advisor will take you through most of this. But some of the things, like creating the subsystem, making it discrete time, making everything single precision, I just know I'm going to have to do, so I do those before I open the workflow advisor. And so at this point, I'm going to walk you through one of the systems and how to generate HDL code from it using Simulink. So as you can see, I've pulled up a remote desktop. This is the machine I'll be using to do the demonstration with. And what is we have here is the subsystem where the I.O. is defined and then internally, which we'll get into, are the details of the model we've deployed to the FPGA. Let's start by just looking at the high level interfaces. So to start with, we've got inputs. So these are our control inputs, six signals, Boolean signals to control the gates. And then we also have an inverter enable. Two additional inputs we have is a torque input so we can control the load from the CPU and then I can also control at what rate the DAC is running at from here if I want to change that and run it at a different rate than the simulation is running at. For outputs, uh, speaking of the DAC, we have the DAC outputs, we have some Boolean outputs which are TTL signals, these are en encoders, and then we actually have some different signals. These are PCI signals. So these, instead of going to a specific pin on an FPGA, they are being sent back to the CPU for processing. So some of them are being used for data acquisition to show on that monitor live so I can see what's going on. And others are just there in case I want access to them for debugging purposes. Uh, so this is just a quick quick overview of how the system is defined. I'll also show you how you map these signals to the specific pins or PCI Express bus lanes that you want to use them with as we go further. Now that we have all of those interfaces defined, we can go to the HDL Workflow Advisor, which will enable us to go through that list of steps I showed you for how to get the model ready to deploy to HDL. So I can select this subsystem, right click, and I'll go to the option for HDL code, and there'll be an HDL workflow advisor. And I can click on that, and it will bring up the, the HDL coder workflow advisor, which is like a wizard to help me 
uh, go through this HDL coder process. And so that's this window that has just come up in the front screen. And we're just going to quick at a high level overview, go over what some of these options are. Uh, so for instance, this first option will allow us to pick our device and target that we're using. So in this case, um, it's letting us select a Simulink real-time FPGA. And we can specify it. And something that's really useful is the, the 1.3 option lets me take all of those uh, different I.O. that we just defined. It lets me go ahead and map them to specific pins uh, so I can take the control signals and map them all as booleans. I can map them all to 3.3 volt logic. And I can continue to do that uh, for all the different signals. And then as I go further, uh, what can be really useful is uh, using this 2.3 to check block compatibility. It will find if there are any blocks that aren't compatible with HDL code generation. Uh, and so I can run to this task. Now, because uh, everything is already set up in this one, all of these are going to pass. But if you had some blocks that weren't HDL compatible, uh, going through this workflow would catch them and uh, give you a link to them so that you could go ahead and fix them. And so what happens is HDL Coder will go through the different checkboxes, make sure everything's good to go. Now, I'm not going to take you through this whole process uh, because uh, as we get down further, for instance, uh, generating RTL right here, this is what creates the HDL. This can take up to five minutes to run to generate your HDL. And then uh, generating your synthesis here in four, that can uh, take up to half an hour or 45 minutes, depending on the complexity of your design. So I don't want to demonstrate those uh, in a live demo, but this is a, a very useful tool that will help you run through that list of steps that I mentioned is how you get a model to be HDL coder uh, compatible. So what happens is if I run HDL workflow to its completion, it runs through the synthesis, it's going to generate a new Simulink model for me. That's going to be very similar to this one, but not quite the same. And so let me open that guy now. And so here is the new model that the workflow advisor will create for me. Now I've tweaked it a bit manually. This was generated uh, March 12th for testing purposes and it works. So I haven't changed it since then. And if I click on this, it's no longer a subsystem. Now it's just a bitstream definition for my speed goat. And I can specify some pull up resistors and PCI slots, but there's not much for me to do with it anymore because it's it's all on the FPGA. And a few things here will be run on the CPU, especially these. And you can set this up however you want. Go into Simulink real-time options. You can choose a name for your system. It's already set up to build for the default target computer and automatically download. So I don't have to do anything. I can just go ahead and start building this. And while it's building, I'm going to start talking to you about uh, the Speedgoat hardware. So I'm going to go uh, back to my laptop and pull up that slide. The most relevant piece of hardware that Speedgoat has available for this type of application is the IO334. The demo I'm doing right now is the IO333, which has the same FPGA, but my card has slower peripherals. So the 334 has the same FPGA, but it has 16 5 megahertz ADCs and has 16 2 megahertz DACs, in addition to having a number of digital I.O. and capability 
for the optical communication using the Aurora protocol. So this is a very powerful card, very useful, whether you're using it by itself or in parallel with a number of them for achieving your Hill applications. And it was designed specifically for the community doing switched simulations. Uh, but so now that I've talked about this, the build is done, so we are ready to go and do a demonstration. It's going to be uh, the same demonstration you see uh, in the video I played earlier because it, it's Hill, so I'm recreating everything exactly. This time I'll stop the oscilloscope so you can uh, see what the waveforms look like for longer. Uh, and then I'll pull up some data I saved from one of the oscilloscopes just so we can zoom in and see that the ripple is actually happening at the rate we say it is. Okay, so I've actually switched over to my webcam, so I'm probably going to sound a little differently so I can move around. So let me get this simulation started, and then I'm going to actually pause the scope. So let me get this. Okay, so I'm going to leave the screen here just so you can see it for a bit, but I'm going to switch back over to my mic and show you the data up closer up so you can see what's going on. So we got the waveforms from that, and we actually have them saved in Simulink Data Inspector, so we can view the results not just from the monitors, but from here. So you can see we're tracking our command values and our rotor velocities. We can see our phase currents. Uh, we can also we can do a view target screen and we can pull the image from the monitor. Let's look at here. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to view that data. Um, but it worked and it, we got what we expected, which, uh, you know, considering we had it working before this WebEx, that's what you would expect. And uh, one final thing I want to show again uh, right now. I'm on the remote desktop, so let me go back to the main presentation and show the final waveform of the currents uh, from the scope. Here are the waveforms from the scope. These are actually from a previous run. I saved them and zoomed in on them. And you can see here, uh, one of these blocks is at 100 microseconds. So you can see the ripple. So here is basically one PWM cycle going on for a controller. So it's running faster than 10 kilohertz. I'm running about 12 kilohertz. So that's why a PWM cycle is faster than 100 microseconds. And so we are capturing those switching events, and we are running the simulation at that rate. You can do the higher fidelity level simulations with this workflow. And that's what we wanted to show you here today that it is possible and that there's a path forward and it's it's fairly user friendly as far as these things go. So to review the steps uh, that we went through and what you'd use HDL Coder to help you with, uh, we started by creating a high level subsystem where we defined the IO that was relevant for a simulation. Uh, we converted the model to discrete time. We converted everything from double to single precision. We used the HDL coder workflow to set up our model settings. We used it to find our HDL compatible blocks. And then we used it to map everything to Xilinx Vado and create a project for synthesis. Once that was done, we are able to deploy this model to Speedgoat, uh, the real time machine, and that's where we ran the high level demonstration. Now some of these, such as converting to discrete time and converting from double to single, we had done prior and we didn't do a, a live demonstration for this uh, summarized video, but you can get more details on that workflow uh, with the webinar that we have online where we actually go through that in a more step-by-step -step process. Additionally, you can contact your sales rep for more information on how to do that. So to wrap things up, we showed you a workflow where the entire process is integrated from desktop simulation to the hill. I was able to accomplish all of this without ever leaving the MathWorks toolchain.
I didn't have to learn how to use Xilinx Vivado. I didn't have to go anywhere to be able to take advantage of Simulink Real-Time and the Speedgoat hardware. And that's really powerful. In addition, the native floating point support for the FPGA just makes it a lot easier to take uh, any sort of Simulink model and have a chance at bringing it to the FPGA and getting those orders of magnitude faster simulation. Whether you're doing it for hill purposes or control purposes or whatever, it just makes it a lot easier to take your models to an FPGA and I highly recommend you check it out and see what's possible using HDL Coder. And one final thing is just how the Workflow Advisor really walks you through this process, makes it really easy to find the pieces that you missed. You don't have to be an expert in this workflow to start moving forward. And again, it lets you map your pins in your IO so you don't have to use Vivado, you don't have to know the hardware, and you can still sit down and start moving forward with this. Uh, so we're really excited about this workflow. We hope that you will start contacting your sales reps and asking more questions about this, as well as uh, talking to Speedgoat and seeing the different types of IO cards and hardware that they have available. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and we're going to now transition to the Q&A.